All right. Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to be here with all of you. And I am so glad that you are here because this is an incredible opportunity for us to have one of our country's preeminent theologians with us, Dr. Cobb, who taught at the Claremont School of Theology from 1958 until 1990 and has written over 50 books. One of his books, Process Theology, an introductory exposition, was required reading at my seminary. And so his thought has always been in the air of theological conversations. And in 2019, there was a Claremont Institute for Process Studies was founded. And that was later renamed after Dr. Cobb. It became the Cobb Institute. And that's what we're going to be learning more about today. I think something else really interesting about Dr. Cobb is a lot of the work that you're doing with China right now and helping people in China think about what it means for that country to be an ecological civilization. Conversations we should probably be having a lot more here in the United States as well. I want to read a little blurb about the Cobb Institute. Because after I read it, if there are words or ideas that don't make sense to you, my hope is that they do once this conversation is over and we will be richer for having been part of this discussion today. So listen to this. The Cobb Institute promotes process and relational ways of understanding and living in the world, seeking to cultivate ecological civilizations through just and compassionate communities. Its vision is to advance wisdom, harmony, and the common good through holistic education, community building, and spiritual exploration. That sounds great. So let's learn a little bit more. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cobb with us. Really quickly, we have some other incredible individuals, Reverend Bunce, John Fahey, who are part of the Cobb Institute, and they're going to be part of our discussion as well. And so they have the theological chops just as much as Dr. Cobb. And so we're really glad that they're here with us today. So you're, wow. you're starting, right, right John? For mistaking me for John Cobb. That <laughs> never happens. <laughs> so you're first. Get up here. Uh, thanks, folks. Uh, my name is John Fahey. I'm on the board of the Cobb Institute. And uh, we wanted to thank um, Pastor Jacob for coming over and having lunch a few weeks ago to talk about this whole format, what we might be able to do to work together. And we're, we're really excited to be here. So I'm gonna go through a couple of different slides just to give you an overview of the Cobb Institute. And then we're gonna turn it over to John to speak and then we'll open it up for questions. So the format is a couple of slides, inform you about the Cobb Institute. John Cobb will speak and then we'll open it up for a discussion. So let me share my screen here and go to slideshow. The most important words we have heard the last three years has been, John Cobb, you're on mute. Come off of mute. So <laughs> we had a challenge getting him to use Zoom and now we can't get him off. He's Zooming everywhere. I introduced him to about 10,000 Chinese folks a few months ago and it was quite an experience. But I wanted to share a few tidbits about uh, the Cobb Institute, what our mission and vision is. As, as Pastor Jacob said, um, we're promoting a process and a relational way of understanding and living in the world, seeking to cult cultivate ecological civilizations through just and compassionate communities like this church. And I've been a member of this church for three years and it's been a delight to get to know some of the folks as well as Pastor Jacob. Our vision is to advance wisdom, harmony and the common good through holistic education. I've logged in from another device. I'm not sure what that means. And spiritual exploration, all the things that happen in this church. We work towards transformations. That's a key word that we like to talk about. And this is a one minute short video of an introduction to a larger uh, documentary that we did back during the um, pandemic. And you'll notice the, the sage like long hair that John Cobb had. We try to tie a lot of different concepts around education, art, music, community organizing, spiritual practices. What does the future church look like? All those types of things. 
one of the fundamental metaphysical insights of Whitehead is that everything comes out of many things. This phrase, we are in this together of COVID-19, has been perfect because it's true. We are in this together and it has always been so for process philosophy. This is about climate change. This is about growing fresh food. This is about creating alternative food systems, which is a right for everyone to have access to fresh food. This is about justice. This is about racial justice. This is about social justice. This is about environmental justice. And we can go even deeper than that spiritually. And what process taught me was all of these things are intertwined. They're not separate things. The Claremont School of Theology recently pulled all the alumni for the most impactful professor that ever taught at CST. John Cobb was the number one professor that impacted students by a landslide. When we think of compassion and being a compassionate city, it, it's an alignment with the Cobb Institute. Uh, and it's a translation of this idea of philosophy into the real world. The Cobb Institute, we put process philosophy to work. Let's just give you a little flavor of, of what we're about. And um, the next few slides just talk a little bit about some of the things that we're working on constantly. And we would invite you to become a member, come to some of our gatherings, get on the mail list. We do classes, we do all sorts of things. So from a fragmented world to a relational world, from a human-centered world to an eco-centered world, from isolated communities, one of John Cobb's favorite sayings, communities of communities of communities. From oppressive social orders to a world of justice. From mutual defensiveness to mutual support. From the goal of wealth to the goal of happiness and well being. From isolated individuals to persons in community. From knowledge as mere data to knowledge as wisdom nourished by multiple ways of knowing from the primacy of analysis to the primacy of creative synthesis, from attachment to, to dogmatic ideologies to openness to evidence, from life-denying spiritualities to life-affirming spiritualities, from nature as mechanistic to nature as alive, from coercive power to the power of love. And I don't think there are Two minutes in the world, two, two ministers in the world more that carry this message out into the community than Jacob and Jack. So that's who we are, the Cobb Institute. This is uh, John Cobb, and I can go through a long list of things that he's accomplished. We don't have to do that this morning. I know we uh, sometimes embarrass him, and we had a fight with him to get, actually rename the Cobb Institute in his honor. Um, I moved to Claremont three years ago, and this is how I think of John Cobb. As a friend and neighbor, he lives right across the street. Every other week, he comes over to my house, and we have coffee, and Dick Bunch joins us, and it's really been quite an honor uh, to get to know John Cobb. So I will stop there and invite my friend and neighbor up. They can figure out how to get out of this. All right, Pastor Jacob, I don't know how I lost this. I'm not getting a cursor. There you go. Okay. You might have logged out of Zoom. Oh, no, there it is. So it's going to be um, that sharing the screen over here on this. So it's there. There you go. We won't make no. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. We're good to go. Okay. Dr. Cobb. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I am a theologian, 
And uh, some people don't recognize that what I'm doing is from my point of view, theological. And of course we don't call the Cobb Institute a theological institute, but I make myself a very definite and specific connection. And the connection I make is between the kingdom of God as we read about it in the New Testament on the one hand and ecological civilization as we work for it today. So I want to help you see that there is a real connection and that if you as a Christian want to work for the kingdom of God, your best opportunity, not necessarily through the Cobb Institute, there are many other ways of doing it, but is to work for an ecological civilization. So first I want to say very briefly what I understand as being in the New Testament, not, not, not what I'm projecting on it, but what I really think I find there, what the term kingdom of God is, means, and also what role it plays. I should say, I, for personally, for me, being a Christian is primarily being not, I mean, I am a church member and I'm professional and all that kind of thing, but primarily it means being a disciple of Jesus. I, I think the church has often moved very far away from that, but it's understanding Jesus that I will be talking about today. What did Jesus mean? Now, first, it's, it's clear that for Jesus, the kingdom of God was a, or the, what we translate that way, was extremely important. It was what he thought all of his work was working toward. The evidence for that is that in two of the gospels, we are told that was his inclusive message. He went out preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. And that phrase at hand is also very important. And then when he was asked, teach us to pray, he said, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That is the first petition. And very often in Hebrew, people said the same thing in different ways together. Thy kingdom come, I think, means exactly the same thing as thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I don't think there's any doubt that this can be spoken of as the central mission of Jesus as he understood it. But what did he understand by that? Well, he understood by that, that Israel could transform itself in such a way that it could survive, which it would not do if it continued on the path of military resistance to the Roman Empire, or if it continued simply to live by the standards and norms that people had been living by, because that would mean constantly being uh, hated by, condemned by, persecuted by the Roman, the Roman Empire. <clears throat> he was offering an alternative to what most of those who claim to be bring, bringing God's will to too bad did they, Israel re revolted against the Roman Empire repeatedly. And uh, just as a fact, we can notice that not too long after the time of Jesus, the Romans got tired of this and forced all Jews to leave Israel, to leave the Palestinian area and scatter in the Roman Empire and Jerusalem was completely destroyed. As Jesus had predicted and anticipated what happened if his message was ignored. And of course his message was ignored. Now that doesn't mean everybody. So he did have a number of followers 
who were trying to live a different kind of life and whose way of life could have, if widely extended, could have prevented the final loss of the, of the land by, by the Jews, okay? So his message had, was of course religious and spiritual and moral, but it was radically political at the same time. And uh, if when we take a phrase like the kingdom of God and turn it into something very individual and personal, we, we're not following what, I mean, Jesus was concerned about what happened in history. Okay, now the, the term kingdom of God is the kingdom is the translation of the Greek word Basileia. And Basileia is simply a country. It says nothing about how it is ruled. And in my view, the notion that it should be translated as kingdom comes from a different set of values, from Jesus' values. Jesus thought of God as Abba. Abba, I grew up calling my father Papa. And in many languages, baby talk has an influence on how parents are, are named. But uh, for Jesus, Abba is not another term for, for king. So the idea that, that we serve a king is um, not from Jesus. And what he says about the kingdom of God doesn't suggest that one person dominates and controls everybody else. So I personally think a more accurate translation of the term would be commonwealth. I think Jesus thought of a commonwealth as being, I mean, I don't mean that he had that term in his mind or something like that. I just mean our language about commonwealth is closer to what he meant by a Basileia than kingdom, okay. Now, the, when we say the kingdom of God, uh, <clears throat> it can also be called the kingdom of heaven. I mean, in the New Testament, you find both phrases, and I don't know of anyone who says these are two different things. So it's, a, it's the heavenly commonwealth. But the term heavenly is all today is a very puzzling word. It doesn't really fit our cosmology. <laughs> well, I, I like to say, if you want to say something that has the connotations that the term had in, for, in Jesus' day, I think the divine commonwealth would be a, a good term to use, okay? And the divine commonwealth is a commonwealth in which God's will is done. God's purposes are fulfilled. And I believe that today, when Jesus presented the divine commonwealth, and if you want to read something about how people act in a, in a divine commonwealth, read the Sermon on the Mount, and you'll find it's very, very demanding. This, this, this is not letting us off of any hooks, <laughs> but it is telling us that the God who we love and serve is not a ruler. He's a very intimate spiritual presence. And I, I think that is a, a message we have lost. It's very sad to me that when we say the Lord's Prayer, we don't say what Jesus taught us to say. We have to add a line. And that line really messes up the whole thing. Remember at the end, you say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Now, where in Jesus', Jesus teachings is the notion of power and glory central to the thinking about God? Abba is not worshipped because of power and glory. Abba is loved because, God, because Abba loves us. 
And because if we love Abba, we will do what Abba wants us to do. And what Abba wants us to do is to transform our lives in very fundamental ways, much more difficult than obeying a set of laws. But it's definitely living out of love and not living for money and sex as we have been taught to do in recent generations. It doesn't mean that money and sex are not important. It simply means that's not where you find meaning. That's, that's not where God's purpose is for us center. Okay. So today, what we, what we see, just as in Jesus' day, he saw if you continue the way you're going now, Israel will be destroyed. They continued the way they were doing now, Israel was destroyed. Now, that, doesn't that sound a little bit familiar? Today, if we continue the way we are going, humanity will be destroyed. Life will be ended. It's much worse than it was at the time of Jesus. So isn't it important for us to think about an alternative? And I think we could call that alternative the divine commonwealth. And in the churches that might work, might may work better. If you want to use that language, fine. But of course, people besides faithful church cause need to be involved in making these changes. Jesus never emphasizes that going to the synagogue is going to make automatically make the changes. The two people, there are two people who have in recent years, I think, understood Jesus, understood what, what it means to live in, in God's way. And they are Gandhi and King. And it's very interesting that the first person in human history to take Jesus seriously was a Hindu, not a Christian. And he liberated India bloodlessly. He made it in independent. And Martin Luther King has had an enormous effect on the understanding and dealing with race all over the world, not only in the United States. So following Jesus can really have a transformative effect. And I think all the things that John Fahey called your attention to that the Cobb Institute is working for. I think that would be following Jesus. So I genuinely believe that as Christians, we are called, you don't have to call it ecological civilization, call it what you want, but it's that kind of change and a change that affects everything in society. It's not something that's in a box over here. Oh, you, know, you could do that kind of stuff over here. But of course, we, won't, we wouldn't dream of applying that to economic issues. I, I regret to say that the one country that is committed to ecological civilization has boxed it off from, from the economy. That's China. China's done a lot in some areas, but when you go, come to the ec economics, it's still following a profoundly unchristian economic theory. <laughs> I think I'm, is it time to quit or do I have a little more time? Okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, well, we, we have a, a little more time, but I would, do want to have, I tell you what, let me stop and see if you have any questions or comments, because if we can have a discussion, that may be more valuable. I can ramble on forever. <laughs> yes. Could I present an edit to our Lord's Prayer on that last sentence? Instead of, God is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. How about, for love, agape, is the commonwealth, the power, and the glory forever, because that is inspirational and sums up the mission concisely at the end. Am I interpreting that way? Oh, absolutely. That? I would love to see the churches actually <laughs> recognize 
that when they say the Lord's Prayer, they really have no business changing its meaning by adding something to what Jesus taught. I, I just, we've been doing that for thousands of years. So much of what we call Christian theology is in flat contradiction to Jesus, including the deification of Jesus. Jesus certainly never, did, never thought of himself as God or demigod. Obviously, he never thought of his father as not his father. That idea came along considerably later. Paul very emphatically says, Jesus is descended from Joseph. It's all of, so much transformation in a direction that makes us blind to what the powerful me teaching of Jesus was, has gone into the definition of what is Christian. That I sometimes think, okay, I'm not a Christian, I'm just a follower of Jesus. But I think the churches could save themselves if they would become followers of Jesus. Let me, uh, Mel, you have a question. Just unmute yourself, Mel, and, uh, and ask a question. Yes, uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> it's wonderful to hear you again. Uh, I, I would like you to uh, tell us what is the central element of an ecological commonwealth? What is the driving principle that will help us steer away from our wasteful and selfish consumption to a more sustainable world? Well, I, I mean, of course, it's very hard to say one thing is it. I think for Jesus, the most distinctive teaching, because he, in most cases, he thought he was really teaching people what they already knew they should be doing. But on, in one case, he says, you have been told, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. He clearly thought he was bringing something radically different into the mix. And uh, I, I have been hesitant to think that Jews are not taught to love their enemies, but certainly it hasn't shown up much in Israel-Palestine, has it? But I, you understand I'm not saying Christians are better. You can go through Christian history and the message of loving your enemies is almost absent, almost absent, until Gandhi came along. But I think that loving enemies is absolutely essential if the world is to survive. Loving enemies doesn't mean you agree with them. Uh, I, I would just, just, just give one example of a difference it would make, would have made but there are thousands of examples I could give. I was in, in the army in World War II. And um, of course, the US was very much involved in war with Japan. And uh, we were taught by all of the media to think of the Japs as, what should I say, not quite human, De we demonized the Japs. Now, the Japanese were ready to surrender some weeks, I think, but maybe only days. And they were negotiating surrender, but they had one qualification. They were ready to surrender if we would promise to respect the emperor. Now, that didn't mean anything in practice. It just meant treat him not as a war criminal, as some people wanted to, but as this, the sacred object of the Japanese people. Now, in fact, we ended up doing that. 
but because they would not surrender unconditionally, we dropped atomic bombs on them. Now, I think that our willingness to kill hundreds of thousands of people rather than have them, rather than promise to respect the emperor. So we didn't love our enemy. We might have fought the war in many similar ways to the way we fought it. But if you had love for the Japanese that you regretting that you're having to kill them and stuff in large numbers, that the, the one request they made would have been easy to honor. Unfortunately, that's by no means an isolated instance. Right now, we are being taught to hate the Russians. And because we are taught to hate the Russians, we are taught to believe all sorts of things about Putin that just aren't so. We are taught to believe that Russia is a threat to the whole of Europe, which is nonsense. We, we are taught to believe that there's no point in listening to what Putin says and what Putin asks and what Putin requests, because after all, he's, he's a demon and demons lie. So we have been cut off from communication and um, we have cut ourselves off. And we have, the Finns became persuaded that Russia wanted to conquer Europe. Now, Putin has told us again and again and again what he wants. And it has nothing to do with all that. But because we have been taught to hate him, we won't listen. If we would listen, I don't think it would be difficult to negotiate a peace. And I have to admit, I don't think the United States government wants peace. It has opposed negotiation all the way through because the United States considers Russia its enemy number two. And what you want to do with enemies is weaken them. And the longer the war lasts, the weaker Russia will be. So I say, and I'm not the only one who's saying it, we will fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. This is not really being helpful to the Ukrainians, although it's, it's all couched in terms of our great concern for them. If we loved the Russians, we would listen to what they have to say and be willing to talk to them. Yes. Could you say then that it would be true that you would give message now to us if we to love Trump? And the followers of President, former President Trump? Yes, I think we do. The United States is divided to, to two groups, each of which demonizes the other. The, now, the, the fact is, the Democrats are just as bad at this as the Republicans. And uh, if you really examine what Trump did, I, I'm personally very supportive of the fact that he put an end to the free trade agreements. In my view, the United States government is more in the service of the transnational corporations than in the service of the American people. And Trump, and uh, it was in the interest of the transnational corporations to have only one power that controls everything and that they can then control. And it is in our, their interest to have completely free trade because that allows them to concentrate production in a few places where labor is cheap and then to sell everywhere. So the, the, those policies were adopted by Clinton and NAFTA was the beginning of the end of industrial labor. It was not quite the beginning, it was already. But industrial labor for a decade or two after World War II was middle class. The union movement moved the poor into the middle class. And when they talk about make America great again, that's what they, what they, what they remember, there was a time that you could get a good job that would pay, pay you middle class and you could put your children through college 
and all kinds of things, but not now. The, gra the gap between the rich and the poor has gone, grown vastly. And you can't blame that on Trump. Now, I personally find it light, di very difficult to like Trump. And I think there's a great difference between liking and loving. I don't think we're commanded to like everybody. And Trump belongs to uh, a group that wants to pay no attention to global warming or any of it. So I hope you won't, won't understand I'm trying to say Trump the good, anti-Trump bad. I'm just saying we should look at everything Trump says, take him seriously. Think about why people are following him, not just dismiss them in contempt. There are very good reasons for many people to think the US was doing heading in the right direction by where the Aristotle Democrats were heading in the wrong direction. Okay, I, I, I hope you don't, I'm not misunderstanding. I'm just saying, if you love your enemy, you'll pay attention to what they say. You won't automatically dismiss everything as, oh, that's Trump, therefore can't take, can't take it seriously. And frankly, if Democrats and Republicans don't learn to love each other, um, I don't know how we're going to maintain a democracy. So I, I consider this, if, if you want me to just take one teaching and say, if we really would do that, the world would have a chance. That, that's the one I would say, but please don't misunderstand. We could also say, understanding that Hum humanity cannot survive without a healthy natural world would be a very, very central teaching of ecological civilization. I'd like to go back to Mel's original question about ecological uh, civilization. Uh, and I taught a class last semester at Laverne. <coughs> it was called Intro to Philosophy, but uh, Elaine Padilla, who you saw on the screen, taught ecological civilization. They were taught as a joint class. Well, how do you translate the ideas into real action? And uh, half the class was on the word ecological, which is what everybody thinks of. But then the other half was on civilization. Was what does it mean to be civilized? What does it mean to be engaged in conversation? What, how do you do that with people that you disagree with? And that might be one of the roles of the church, certainly so historically. No, no, I, obviously that's, that's what I'm saying. I think if you're really serious about following Jesus, you, you may not agree with every detail of whatever anybody has said about ecological civilization, that you understand there are lots and lots of debates that could go on internal. But if you're really saying what changes would be needed if we are to survive as, a, as civilized human beings on this planet, then you are asking, for, as far as I'm concerned, you are asking the question of ecological civilization. And thank you, I think that's very important. And uh, the word community is so important also. If you, and you understand our economic theory is based on the idea there is no community. I think that's a serious mistake. And to base your whole economic theory and then all of your national policies on a lie, I don't, but I don't like it at all. But we are told that we are individuals, each one separate from every, everyone else. And we are told that we, we all want good things for ourselves. And we are told that those good things are, in, are, scar are scarce. Therefore, our relations with each other are all competitive. And when you teach everybody that competing is what life is about, and that the purpose of education is to help you compete more successfully, and that there are no values that you need to take into account, what can you expect as the outcome? Certainly not a not a livable world. Ecology has slightly different connotations from community. 
And that's another very interesting discussion, but I won't. <laughs> John's been talking since 1958, so you, you can always bring him back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it's one of the things that we've been doing is fostering these sorts of conversations in different faith communities. There's a, you know, John was the founder of the Center for Process Studies, which extension of that is the uh, processing faith, which historically was largely Christian, and now it's becoming much more interfaith type of dialogue. Although, personally, I think we, have, we need to have more inter-Christian dialogue to really talk more about yeah. what is the meaning of Jesus and what was the message. And I, every time I come to one of these, I learn something. I've never heard the thing about the line in the Lord's Prayer. I think that there's so much richness in that topic, you know, power. Who has the power? How much power, how much power does God have? How much power do I have? The doctrine of omnipotence is the worst doctrine in Christianity. Maybe we can ask the uh, one, online audience if they have any, any other questions. Sure. <clears throat> Anybody out on Zoom, any other further questions there? Just unmute yourself. <laughs> so I'll ask a question. Good. Um, so I wanted to know um, uh, what the Cobb Institute is doing, uh, what activities are you engaged in educationally uh, to promote sustainability in the broadest definition? Uh, well, uh, I think see, the Cobb Institute used was initially developed to work locally. When the pandemic turned us into a Zoom organization, <laughs> <laughs> but I I would say I'm particularly excited about what's happening in Pomona, and this is not the Cobb Institute doing it. The Cobb Institute is participating with others, and I hope that. From my point of view, participating with others is a very important part of working for an ecological civilization. So I don't say that to put us down. I say, I think we're doing the right thing. But the city of Pomona, uh, Dick Bunce lives in Pomona and he's been playing a role in this all along. I'll say very briefly, it is hosting the most interesting manufacturing business operation that I think exists in the world at the present time in a CHIRP. The manufacturing of solar panels is up until very recently, they were all being manufactured in China. I, I'm not against China at all. I do a lot, do a lot of work in defend China against lots of the criticisms, but this is not a survivable world to, to manufacture in one place and then ship to, a, to distant places. We need locally self-sufficient communities that will be able to survive collapse in society. We will have all kinds of collapses in society. And so Pomona can become self-sufficient in energy and through a business that is deeply committed. It's a nonprofit business, interesting combination. And one that already is being copied in other parts of the country. So Pomona is already in that respect, becoming an, a model. And so doing things in Pomona can have much wider implication. Uh, yesterday, yes, yes, morning, I was in Pomona for a meeting of the many people who have taken up the effort to produce food in Pomona, an immediate environment. And I think that communities that are dependent on bringing food from great distances are going to have a lot of starvation. 
I think it's extremely important. Now, Pomona is a long way from being self-sufficient in food production, but there are now hundreds of people in Pomona who really care about this and are really working for it. And I don't mean just Pomona. There, there is also a great deal of interest in the economy. It's been pointed out strongly that it is the habit of institutions in Pomona and of middle-class individuals in Pomona to shop mainly outside of Pomona. And so the money that comes into Pomona, instead of circulating in Pomona, goes to New York or China or somewhere else. And there's going to be a serious effort in Pomona to develop much more circulation of money. And Devin Hartman is very much involved in this as well. And Devin Hartman's on our board of advisors. We have a number of different board of advisors, but the Cobb Institute itself does primarily three things. One is education. <laughs> we hold classes around all sorts of topics, but a lot as we've mentioned on philosophy and religion. And they're on they're either Zoom or they're hybrid. Secondly, we do spiritual integration type of work with different faith, faith communities. And, and third, it's sort of going out into the community and working with other community organizations. And that really has been led by Michael Whitmer, who some of you may know, but also uh, Dick Bunce. Dick, do you want to say anything about the work in Pomona? You've been- uh, He's at the heart of it. <laughs> okay, in a minutes, because uh, I see our time just about up. Uh, the Latino and Latina Roundtable has joined with the Institute for Ecological Civilization. And this was prompted by this coming together was prompted by the Cobb Institute. And their purpose is to create. <laughs> there. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that. Their purpose is to create an economy that seeks the well being of the maximum number of people. And by well being, we're talking about just meeting people's needs, their basic needs, as opposed to excessive uh, response to need. And uh, so one of the ways of doing this is to get as close as possible to the grassroots level. And there's plenty of that in Pomona. Pomona has almost double the poverty that exists uh, across the United States uh, in terms of the, the median level in a local community. So anyway, uh, one of our great uh, efforts now is to form worker-owned cooperatives and to draw people from those streets, those areas of Pomona that are uh, chronically unemployed uh, into the labor force. And uh, we're very hopeful about this because there are models not just in the around the world, but models around the country and even within the county of Los Angeles for doing just this. But we're excited about it. And we have, I just have to say, we're on the cusp now of receiving a planning grant of $600,000 uh, for an 18 month uh, study on how to go about this. So this is serious stuff and, and it's a big deal for the city of Pomona. And I think by extension for the Pomona Valley as well and beyond that. And if you want to get involved in something, get in touch with Dick. He has his hands on all of this. I know our time is coming to an end here, and um, we really appreciate your time, and thank you. Um, you know, please become a friend. We call them friends. We don't call them members. We've got about 400 friends, um, and John's got about 10,000 that he reaches out to over Zoom. And, um, you know, it's really been... Uh, quite an experience. On Tuesday mornings, we have these conversations called Friends with Friends of John Cobb, where we'll have somebody from some place in the world zoom in, give a short lecture for 15 minutes, John comments, and then we open it up for a dialogue. And that, because of Zoom, has kind of exploded. And then we have all sorts of different classes that we offer and working towards an ecological civilization. So I'll give John Cobb the last word. Oh, wow. I'll just say next Tuesday, a Chinese woman is speaking about topics along these lines. 
And on behalf of the adult education committee, let me thank you, John, and thank all of you for a fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah.